asshole. Riverport University. Here we are. Hey. Thanks for the ride. No problem. Finally got around to beating Quantum Break. Originally, I was going to treat it like a regular thinking bout and talk about the gameplay, the story, and the TV show that gets bundled with the game. But as I read through my 7 page script, I realized that I barely scratched the surface when it came to writing a full review in the game. It's fine. So I thought, screw it. I'll do this like I did Fallen Order and focus only on my takeaways from the experience. I'll talk about why I like Quantum Break's combat compared to Controls or Alan Wake's, and what worked or didn't work for me with the TV show tie-in. At the end, I'll have a potpourri of thoughts regarding certain design decisions. You guys aren't actually planning to use this machine, are you? So, why do I like Quantum Break's combat? When you look at Remedy's oeuvre, you can tell that there's a definite line between Old Remedy and New Remedy in their games. Historically, Remedy's been very good at making third-person shooters featuring a singular game mechanic. Max Payne introduced bullet time to the world, and Max Payne 2 refined it by enhancing bullet time's effects after getting some kills in. After that, Remedy gave Max up to Rockstar, and you know how I feel about Max Payne 3. Alan Wake also focused on a singular game mechanic, specifically using light sources to weaken enemies and then finishing them off with your guns. Alan's only defensive ability is to dodge incoming enemy attacks, and doing it at the right time triggers a slow-mo effect that's more for flair than utility. Quantum Break expanded on what players could do in a Remedy game, but in true Remedy fashion, it brought a lot of quirks to its approach. First, it's a cover shooter without a dedicated cover button. Usually, I'd balk at playing a cover shooter that didn't let me choose when I could use cover, but it's not that big of a deal in QB. This might be one of the earlier instances of a game with good auto cover. You can press up against the wall just as easily as you could get away from it. The other quirk to this game is that there's no hip or blind fire. You have to ADS to be able to shoot your guns. This feels out of character for a Remedy title, because their games place so much emphasis on run and gun tactics. I think even Remedy knew this felt off, because Jesse can hip fire in control. Instead of having a single power, Jack has six, and they're all useful. The most important ones for me are Time Dash and Time Rush. Dash gets you out of harm's way in a pinch and you can upgrade it to increase the slowdown effect at the tail end of a dash so that you can line up shots before enemies can respond. Think of it like Witch Time in Bayonetta. Rush is Dash's bigger brother and lets you move around the arena while time is slowed down. It's handy when you're fighting heavily armored enemies that can turn on a dime so you can get behind them and destroy the cooling fan on their backs. You can also upgrade it to increase the slowdown effect like Dash, and running up to basic enemies lets you do a melee takedown. Time Shield is handy when you've overextended yourself in a fight and wind up exposed to enemy gunfire. It blocks incoming bullets, and upgrading it will heal Jack while he's inside the shield. Time Stop causes Jack to create a stasis bubble that freezes in place anything and anyone inside the bubble. The game encourages you to freeze an enemy with Stop, and then dump your gun's entire mag into the bubble. Doing so will cause a small, localized explosion when time resumes and the bullets go flying. It's good for burst damage on stronger enemy units, when your guns just aren't enough. You can charge your stop power to create a more powerful explosion, but it takes a while for the cooldown timer to reset, so you can't use it all the time. Jack also has a pretty good instance of detective vision, I mean time vision. Use it to bring up a muted overlay on the screen that highlights things of interest, such as backpacks for ammo resupplies, items you can interact with to progress the plot or gain more insight into the setting, and it also pings any nearby enemies. The reason why I like Quantum Break's combat is that Jack's time powers enhance his mobility and survivability in a fight, which allows him to get the most use out of his arsenal, as well as the cover provided in a given space. Although Jesse has more unique powers and control, they don't really work with her gun. Instead, it always felt like launch was the most viable option in a fight, and Jesse's gun was there to attack enemies that can dodge at projectiles. Jesse also has a dash and shield power like Jack, but she doesn't get to use Witch Time following a dash or to heal while our shield is active like Jack. Time Dash and Time Rush allow Jack to safely move through an arena 
so that he can flank enemies or get away while minimizing damage. This mobility goes hand in hand with the game's auto cover mechanic, so that Jack can easily perform hit and run tactics without any friction from the controls. You know a game is good when it lets you close the distance with an enemy so that you can give him the old Dick Cheney. And if you end up spending all of your time rush or time dash meters, you can still prevent a quick death out of cover by popping your shield. My only sticking point with combat is that there are no stealth options. I understand that Remedy isn't going for that kind of experience, but there are so many moments where it would have felt natural for Jack to enter a room unnoticed instead of setting off every guard the moment he stepped through a door. <laughs> stealth options, no matter how anemic, are something we tend to expect from action games now, so it feels out of place to not have anything like that implemented in Quantum Break. Also, I think Control's UI is much cleaner than Quantum Break's, because seeing all these icons on the right side of the screen makes the game look like a cheap mobile game that got a lazy PC port. I'm not gonna get into the plot. Your favorite son has a really thorough video detailing the game's development and plot synopsis, so I'll post a link to that video here. My friend described Quantum Break's hybrid TV show structure as an evolutionary dead end for Remedy's narrative style, and I agree with him. Listening to radios and watching TVs has always been a Remedy staple since the Max Payne's. If you want to get the most out of the setting, you have to stop in place and soak in the atmosphere. You still do that in Quantum Break, but I had another friend point out to me that these media bits don't get any subtitles. I'm not sure how that oversight happened when the subtitles get particular over whether Jack is speaking in the moment or in a voiceover summing up the events. The TV show conceit probably stems from how Alan Wake is framed as a season of a primetime network show, with recaps of the previous episode for every new chapter. Once I got over the fact that I wouldn't be playing the game in 20 minute intervals, I acclimated the Quantum Break's rhythm and even looked forward to seeing how the episodes would unfold. It's a cool novelty, but it's about as sustainable as anything else modern AAA gaming has been trying to popularize in the past decade. I've heard that Remedy did exhaustive research on the logistics of time travel, and I believe it because there's so much reading material to pour over. In fact, there's too much reading material, and they ended up skimming over all of it. I think Remedy realized that putting so many words in a document was off-putting, because none of the documents in control take up more than a single page. Conceptually, it's impressive how Remedy was able to use the same cast from the game for the show. It blurs a line when it comes to describing what it means to be a video game and is why I describe Quantum Break as a multimedia experience. The overall tone of the work feels like early 2000s era primetime network TV, something like Lost or Fringe. Like, there's just enough of a budget to keep the show looking good for four 20 minute episodes, and that's not counting the footage you don't see because of choices you didn't make. Once you get to the final act, the events of the show feed back into the game. I was actually interested in seeing where the show was headed with a specific character, but I think Remedy fumbled it in the end. The show goes into the life of a side character and the path that led him ultimately to becoming a mini-boss in the final act. This could have worked but for one specific change. He shouldn't have become a faceless goon. I get that Remedy wanted to humanize the nameless grunts we've mowed down for the last 10 hours, but by turning the character into another enemy type, it robbed him of any distinguishing features. The show already made a point to have equipment that made whoever wore it immune to the time setters that freeze everyone else in place. This equipment is so discreet that a person can hide it by wearing a jacket. I think it would have been more impactful to keep the character in his plain clothes, but give him the equipment that lets him move like Jack. It would have made him resemble a proper rival instead of being another body to flatten. Seeing that face put it into perspective. They were all misled, manipulated to believing they were doing what was right what was necessary. Liam Burke made his choice. Liam Burke was an unnecessary casualty. One of way too many. The worst part about all this is a punchline that happens later in the same act, when you see the guy's past self joking about how he's not dressed like a goon. Where's your uniform? Excuse me. I think the novelty of making choices as a villain that affect what you'll see in the show segments are a cool idea, but it was already a dated concept by 2016. The choices are always binary, so it just feels like I'm playing another infamous title. Also, I didn't really see anything that warranted all the effort to shoot alternate footage besides two events that were ultimately inconsequential. The character writing is top notch. Beth and Liam are standouts, 
and Lance Reddick and Aiden Gillen are consummate professionals. They're not phoning any of this in. Truth is, Sophia, it's not really a matter of whether or not Paul will listen to me. It's that I won't listen to you. Do I look threatened to you? I grew up reading Animorphs, so I'm a big Sean Ashmore fan. But I gotta admit that Jack is pretty milquetoast when it comes to Remedy Protags. That's fine though, since Ashmore has plenty of charisma to keep the character from becoming too forgettable. Jack Joyce! In the flesh. The esteemed Mr. Paul Serene. I'm shaking money bags. Something I like about the internal consistency between the gameplay and TV show sections is that you can pick up guns off of enemies frozen in stutters, and the show acknowledges this when Jack forces Liam and Beth to play nice. The biggest weak point in the plot is that the game is written with a sequel hook. I'm not sure if Remedy will ever pick this up again, now that they have Alan Wake 2 done and they're already planning a control sequel. Also, because Lance Reddick won't be able to return, despite the post credit stinger saying otherwise. I think the game's ending clashed with its themes. Everything that happens follows a closed time loop theory, where you can't change the past because any action you take will inevitably cause the very thing you try to prevent. Despite knowing this, Jack still thinks he can rescue someone who's been shown to have a very definite death in the past. But nothing in the game disproved the closed time loop theory, and I thought Jack's arc was that he would learn to let go and accept things as they are. I know it's a lot to take in, but the fact that you managed to save me and yet still maintain the illusion of my death is actually further proof of my point. Risk the past remains intact, Stick to the nothing changes, and the Novikov self-consistency principle prevails. Oh, great. We can high-five about that later. Coming back to this game after playing Control and knowing that LMA 2 finally dropped changes how you perceive certain easter eggs. There's graffiti spread in the walls that seem to refer to Control but you wouldn't have known that back when Quantum Break first released. And Remedy never gets tired of this running joke. I need the code to the seventh floor door. Sure, sure. I know it. I know it. Wait. Oh yeah. 667. The <laughs> neighbor of the beast. Get it? Yeah. I get it. I need the gate pass code. They need me there. there. Fuck if I know. I know. Yeah, gate, yeah, gate code, code is... is 665. Five. Neighbor of the beast, you know? And then there's all the Alan Wake references. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. I think the funniest one is a trailer teasing what's supposed to be Alan Wake 2. It's clear that Remedy always intended to introduce a new female character to the setting, but they're white in the trailer. I don't think Remedy had anything in mind with the recast, but this is one of those coincidences that someone running a hate click channel on YouTube could capitalize on. I like the look of the company and its private army, but someone had to have told Sam Lake that the villains looked like they came from the Venture Brothers, and it boggles my mind that they went ahead with it anyways. And as much as I like Aiden Gillen's work here, he will never not be CIA to me, and no amount of Zawardo powers can make this man appear threatening. Speaking of which, I love how Quantum Break kept up the Remedy tradition of including an incredibly mid-final boss. Flood the room full of ads, keep the boss high up and out of our reach, and make it stupidly easy to kill him. Classic Remedy. For all the shit I give Max Payne 3, I have to admit that Quantum Break is conceptually its twin, if that twin spent all of undergrad watching Primer instead of Collateral. Both games are third-person shooters that have a strong emphasis on their respective plots and keep a firm hold in their pacing to ensure that the player gets the intended experience. Max is far more restrictive in that most chapters alternate between shootout arenas and transitional cutscenes that corral the player into the next arena. Quantum Break has a looser grip on the leash, but it's still a controlled experience. If you're not shooting, then you're walking around and reading text entries, watching TVs, listening to radios, examining points of interest, and your level of engagement is monitored by how many narrative objects you've encountered. What really hammered home for me how much Quantum Break and Max Payne 3 felt like sibling games was how their bullet cams felt so similar. Bullet cams in the first Max Payne would hold onto an enemy as he fell to the ground. Bullet cams in these two games would cut in more aggressively and end as abruptly as they started. Oh! Almost forgot. Both games do this really annoying thing where the transition from cutscene to combat defaults Max's and Jack's equipped guns to their pistols because that's what they use as mocap reference for the transitions. That's all I have to say about Quantum Break. It's an interesting but very expensive experiment. 
and I think it's an important milestone in Remedy's history, as the particle technology developed for Quantum Break returns to control, as well as a perfect lip syncing for the in game models. Also, certain key actors return in their later games, and it feels like you're watching your favorite director use the same talent pool in all of his works. It's hard for Remedy to make any references to Quantum Break because the IP is owned by Microsoft, but I heard that Sean Ashmore returns in Alan Wake 2 as Sarah Breaker's son, Tim. So his name is effectively Quantum Breaker. I'm telling you, Sam Lake is the only white dude who can pull off Kojima naming conventions for his characters. If you haven't already experienced it, check out Quantum Break. I won't blame you if the thought of having to watch TV to play a game puts you off, but this is one of those weird experiments you'll never see again in AAA gaming. <laughs>